How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, I educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage, news stories, book, movie reviews, and interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, patient advocates, and professors in the field of genetics. Today's episode, I'm talking about what I learned at two events I recently attended at UConn. Environment, epigenetics, and cancer, how to cultivate the connections and genetic editing, the CRISPR revolution. I was able to catch up with the CRISPR presenter, Sharon Begley, after her presentation, so definitely stay tuned for that. Um, I'm going to play that interview in a bit. But before I get into that event, I want to talk about the environment, epigenetics, and cancer, how to cultivate the connections. This event was in recognition of October being National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The keynote presentation was from Dr. Mary Beth Terry, and it was breast cancer susceptibility, rethinking the role of environment, and methods to improve risk assessment. She started out by discussing breast cancer risk factors that can increase the risk up to twofold. So I'm going to list a couple. Early menarche, you're having your period early. Never pregnant, never breastfed. Late age at first birth. Late menopause. Hormone use. Overweight. And alcohol. Now those factors can increase the risk of breast cancer development twofold. Now, factors that increase the risk over twofold, so way more, include having a family history of breast cancer, having a personal history of benign breast disease, and the third is mammographic density. So these are all studied risk factors, but the list doesn't end here. These are all things, or at least most of them, that the public has heard of. But there's a lot more that influence breast cancer Um, from the environment. And a lot of this um, that I just mentioned was things that are controlled really by genetics and not as much environment. Something to keep in mind is that 70% of breast cancer is sporadic. What does that mean? It means that you don't have an inherited genetic mutation that caused the breast cancer and basically that it's come from the environment or your environmental exposures. Now, Ashkenazi Jewish people have taught us in the medical field a lot about how genes are part of the explanation, but not the whole explanation. So you're like, what am I talking about? Ashkenazi Jewish people um, are at an increased risk for having and inheriting BRCA mutations that increase the risk of developing breast cancer. These genes are much more prevalent in this group of people, Ashkenazi Jewish people, than the general public. And studying these families we can see that some people inherit this BRCA mutation, but don't ever develop breast cancer. That's right. You can have the mutation for your B- for BRCA and never actually develop breast cancer. It just greatly, greatly increases your risk, up to 85% risk for developing breast cancer. So how do we sort out, wow, some people have this mutation, never have breast cancer. Some people have the same exact mutation, and do develop breast cancer. So what's the difference? Environmental things, if their genetics for that gene are the same. Now, this is kind of what we call, it's not fully penetrant. So it's modified by something else, as I said, like the environment. And a big kind of um, dissociation is how people in the healthcare field tell people that all right, you have a family history of breast cancer, there's really nothing you can do to lower your risk. So that's one group of people. And I'm not saying everyone says this, but it's kind of a a general consensus among a lot of patients that they kind of get this message or have this feeling after leaving appointments. And then we have another group of people that they don't have a family history. And so they're told, here's all the things you can do to lower your risk of breast cancer. Now, why the different groups is really the core question here. We should be approaching this as saying, all right, you do have a family history, but there's other ways that you can lower your risk. And for those that don't have a family history, say, that's fantastic. You don't have a family history. And also keep in mind how you can lower your risk further. Another thing that people 
think about um, when they hear breast cancer is they've kind of paired it with BRCA, which we can um, give a big thanks to Angelina Jolie, among a lot of other celebrities that have really brought this into the mainstream media. But there are more genes than BRCA that really contribute to the development of breast cancer. So having a mutation of BRCA is not the only gene that we have identified. There's way more. Now, BRCA is well known because of uh, Angelina Jolie and others, but I'm going to list a couple that um, are other genes. P10, TP53, which TP53 is in a lot. Um, it's called the guardian of the genome, kind of nicknamed. ATM, HER2. So those are just four off a super long list. I'm going to put that list. Um, it's in a review article. So I'm going to put the review article uh, link on my website, dnapodcast.com. You can just go to today's episode um, and look at it there. And you can look at all of the genes that I don't have time to mention. Another aspect of Dr. Terry's presentation was about risk models and how we identify what someone's risk is of developing breast cancer. Now, something that is a kind of core concept here is that anything changes over time um, can't just be genes because if we see a change over time in our lifetime, that's a very short uh, amount of time, not relative to us, but relative to evolution. Evolution with genetics takes a very long time. We haven't seen evolution, you know, ourselves of humans, but it's happening. Now, these differences... Um, in elevated occurrences of breast cancer can't just be due to genes because we wouldn't see it skyrocket this much. It has to be due to environmental changes. And so there are different models that uh, we use to calculate this risk, and there are huge differences between these models. Now, some models only look at immediate family or first-degree relatives. We're talking mom, brother, son, daughter, your immediate family. Whereas other models kind of span the scope a little bit wider and look at second degree relatives, grandparents, aunts, cousins, nieces, a little bit further. Now, something to keep in mind is that most cancer is polygenic, meaning that there are multiple genes involved. So it's hard, just, just like breast cancer, there's multiple genes involved. So it's hard to look at genetics to really um, show us a really good indication of things. We have identified the BRCA gene and we kind of know the risk factors associated with those mutations, but there's way more factors that go into it than just having that mutation. That's really the take-home message here. And some models look at related cancers. So a related cancer to breast cancer is ovarian cancer. And so for ovarian cancer and breast cancer, we're looking in the family for the age of onset age of first menarche for personal history, um, as well as the age of um, births and current age. So that sounds a lot more precise than just looking at uh, first degree relatives. If you're looking at second degree relatives, you're looking at a lot of factors in a personal uh, health history. That's going to be way more um, accurate and comprehensive. So it's really best if we can combine all these types of models because there's not really one that stands out so much because they have all different factors that they're looking at to come up with their risk factor number. So obviously the numbers are going to be different. Um, so Dr. Terry really urged that we need to combine the best risk factors into one model um, and looking at non-genetic and genetic info. So knowing the genetics isn't, isn't everything. And environment, obviously, I keep saying, plays a big factor in cancer. And one thing we can look at is women who have a BRCA mutation status. So they have a mutation, one of these genes, BRCA1 or 2. And we can look at how smoking affects their risk. Now, they're already at high risk because they're BRCA, mutation positive. If we add smoking onto that, it greatly increases that already high risk compared to groups that are BRCA positive and that do not smoke. Showing that it's not just genes, it's also the environment, and you can increase or decrease your risk even by having these inherited mutations, by taking these lifestyle changes, by not smoking, and other things like that. And breast cancer has four major time periods 
of influence in terms of tissue development. So these changes when they're happening are vulnerable points. So there's four main. The first one is prenatal, uh, the fetus stage. Second is puberty. Third is breast or um, pregnant, uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. And the fourth is menopause. And the idea here of kind of outlining these different um, stages and vulnerable time periods um, in terms of breast cancer tissue development is saying, can we target prevention earlier in these stages somehow? And by earlier prevention, we can really modify the risk trajectory and saying that instead of intervening when signs start showing up later in life, can we go earlier? Can we go to puberty? Can we even go to prenatal to really affect that trajectory and not have it end up being such a high risk of developing breast cancer for some people? And genetics and epigenetic influences are really what's influencing this trajectory and saying how the environment is playing into our genetics and what genes are being expressed. That's what epigenetics is all about. So we really need to be better at characterizing the underlying trajectory and then looking at how we can modify it and really taking a step back and looking at all this information. And it's important to note that breast cancer is now the number one cancer in most countries in the world. Probably why it's had a lot of media attention recently. And it's just astounding that 20 years ago, this was not the case. Breast cancer and prostate cancer are becoming the dominating cancers in the world. And 20 years ago, that was not apparent. And what's changed in 20 years? Not our genes. That would take much longer than 20 years to really um, have that big changes naturally, but the environment has changed a lot in the last 20 years. After Dr. Terry's um, keynote, there was a panel uh, with her and other guest panelists, um, Dr. Gary Lee Ginsberg, a taxologist for the CT Department of Public Health, Ellen Matloff, a certified genetic counselor and president of My Gene Council, where I also work, and Dr. Christina Stevenson, an oncologist at UConn Health. And they discussed a lot of things related to breast cancer. And the first kind of question and point they had was the current recommendation for breast cancer screening and if they agreed with it. And right now, screening is starting at 40 unless there's a reason for earlier screening, such as, um, you know, a family history of breast cancer, for instance. And these are the women with an average risk, but we don't really know what an average risk is, which is one of the problems that most of us um, aren't, don't even have an average risk. So it's hard to say average or normal, um, these days, but especially in this scenario. So it's best to screen really as much as we can and as much as we can afford. And risk-based is where it's headed instead of age-based. So instead of looking at how old someone is saying, all right, well, maybe we should start, you know, screening you because you're 40 or 35 or whatever age you are, but looking really just at risk because, People that are young, people in their 20s can get breast cancer. People in their 70s can then get breast cancer. So it really depends on the risk more than anything else. But if you have a high risk, um, they recommend that it's good to start screening um, MRI at 25 and then six months later um, uh, mammogram and kind of flip-flop those every six months between MRI and mammogram. Now, something that was interesting that I hadn't heard uh, before in a panel was discussing the responsibility of the employer to reduce risk. So now we're talking about workplace um, influence. And will it be stigmatized by personal testing? And how can we prevent this in the workplace? And something I want to mention is GINA, uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And this prevents um, businesses of a certain size from firing employees for genetic um, information that they acquire. Um, And it covers a lot more. Um, But the thing is, is that people really don't know about Gina. And uh, this was passed in 2008. But they, employer, employees are given a packet and they're kind of told about it, but, you know, just sign it, whatever. But they're not really educated on it. It's not informed consent in a lot of cases. So 
within the next 10 to 20 years, we hope to see those radical changes in what the average person thinks of genetic testing with personalized screening and seeing it as um, something that is a really good option. And many companies are offering genetic testing and genetic counseling to employees because they're starting to realize they need healthy employees and by offering them these health benefits, it ends up having a lot of prevention in cancers and other um, diseases that their employees stay healthy. And because turnover um, of employees is so expensive, this ends up being um, cost efficient in a lot of cases. So this is something, uh, this is a point that Ellen Matloff brought up uh, from my gene council. And it's a really good point that um, this can really be changing in, in the next couple of years that we can see this kind of coming down the pipeline and more companies offering genetic testing and genetic counseling because of this. Now, does everyone know or are they aware that the environment does play a role and can we modify our risks? So it's not like we have the gene and then we have a set risk, right? That's something that I've been talking a lot about, that just because we know a mutation doesn't mean we know exactly the risk. It's kind of a, a wide um, range. And most people in the research field think we don't have major studies of environment impact on cancer development, which isn't true. We do have a lot of studies. And timing of exposure is really important. We have evidence that environment is making an impact in human breast cancer. One evidence is that breast cancer and prostate cancer have become the dominating cancers worldwide. Now, that's different from 20 years ago. So again, that timing of exposure um, is very key in that that's become very prevalent in the past 20 years. Um, and another uh, concept is when you have something that is DNA damaging and cell division happening, um, so things that we get exposed to prenatally, um, that's really an important time period, obviously, we're developing. And having anything that is DNA damaging um, or affecting cell division can really set the stage for cancer. And most people get that breast cancer um, will say, how did I get it? No one in my family has it. So I think one major kind of myth out there is that you're at a very low risk um, to get breast cancer if you don't have a family history, which part of that is true. If you do have a family history, you're at an increased risk. But as I said at the top of the show, 70% of breast cancer is sporadic. So 70 cases out of 100 will not be due to inherited genetic factors. It will be due to environmental exposures that has led to the development of cancer. So 70% is sporadic. It's important to talk about inherited cancers because that can be identified earlier. Um, but sporadic cancers is still the majority of cancers, cancers that um, just kind of appear and that um, don't have inherited traits. The other event I attended at UConn was Gene Editing, the CRISPR Revolution, and Sharon Begley was the presenter. She has an interesting angle because she's a science communicator, so she's not a researcher, um, she's not a professor, um, she is the senior science writer at STAT, the life sciences publication of the Boston Globe, and she came to discuss the invention and evolution of CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And She's very skilled at taking complex scientific concepts and explaining them in a way the public can understand. So I can really admire her uh, because that's kind of my goal on this show. And so she explained CRISPR, it's a genetic editing technology, um, as being an assembly of guide RNA molecule, a cutting enzyme such as Cas9, and sometimes a repair template that hones in on the target DNA. The Cas9 enzyme then snips out the gene or DNA of interest then the cell repairs the break with the provided template. So I think that's a really good explanation. Um, it is a little bit high level. So just to break it down a little bit further, it's when this guide RNA goes to a certain site um, on the DNA, maybe a certain gene, and uses these molecular scissors, as I like to call them and others do, um, that are a cutting enzyme. So an example of this would be Cas9, which is the most uh, popular and, and widely talked about um, enzyme that's used in CRISPR, so CRISPR-Cas9. So this guide RNA is bringing the scissors to a certain point on the DNA and cutting it. And where it's cut, that's that little bit of DNA kind of floats off somewhere, and the um, rest of the DNA kind of fixes itself. So a little piece gets cut out, and then it's kind of taped back together. 
So she discussed a lot of ways CRISPR is making an impact in research. And she could have gone on for, you know, days because there's just so many ways it's making an impact in research. And one type of method CRISPR is being used is by answering what a gene does. And this is kind of a broad example. Um, CRISPR can delete a gene and then a researcher can see what the effects the cell has and therefore narrow down what the function of that gene is. So if you turn a gene off or you cut it out and you say, all right, what happened to the cell? If it stops doing a certain process, that probably means that that gene has at least a role in making that process happen. So this is kind of like knockout genes, but a little bit different way um, of doing it. A couple more specific uses of CRISPR include modeling kidney and heart disease, learning more about normal development prenatally, and therapies also um, are another major area of interest. So therapies for sickle cell, muscular dystrophy, and hep B are being researched. But outside the realm of healthcare, CRISPR has effects on agriculture, plants, and animals. We're using it to enhance plants. So a biotech company is using CRISPR to knock out the genes in peanuts that code for the proteins that make people allergic so that um, we won't ha possibly have peanut allergies in the future if we can modify um, peanuts that are being produced. Um, there's also another biotech company that is um, producing gluten-reduced wheat and lower saturated fat canola oil, uh, reduced trans fat soybean oil. So really modifying things um, to make them kind of healthier. Um, and uh, at Penn State, they're working on a mushroom that doesn't turn brown when it's cut. Um, and there is another huge concept that I'm just going to tease that CRISPR crops or crops that um, CRISPR has been used on, which is a kind of cool phrase. CRISPR crops do not need regulatory approval as GMOs do. And this is because it's not inserting a gene from a different species. G genetically modified organisms are talking about organisms that have genes from other organisms in them. And because CRISPR doesn't have this, and it's just modifying uh, the genome of an organism and not including any other DNA from different organisms, it's technically not a GMO. So in terms of uh, labeling things and laws related to GMOs, it doesn't apply to crispr crops. Um, so that's a really interesting topic. And there's so many more. So I'm here with Sharon Begley at the Yukon Leadership event, and she just gave a presentation on CRISPR, which was very well spoken and really brought down to a level that layman people can understand. You don't have to be a science major to really follow what she was talking about. And CRISPR can be a complex thing to understand at the beginning. So definitely um, props to you for really being able to explain that well. A um, couple questions on what you think the trajectory for CRISPR is going to be. Obviously, there's so many different areas that um, it's really popping up in, but where do you see it really being key in making huge advances in that field? I think we're going to see incredible research advances um, just coming every week or, or even more. I'll give you just one example. Just yesterday, literally, um, there was a study released in which researchers had used CRISPR to march through, as it were, the human genome and find several score genes that are involved in HIV AIDS infection. No other genetic technology would have let them find so many genes so quickly. This was literally a project of two postdocs working for just a couple of weeks um, with earlier technologies that would have taken years. So basic discoveries like that will continue to be made very, very quickly. So there will be, you know, when I look into my crystal ball, a very vast accumulation of knowledge. But then the question is, how quickly will that knowledge be leveraged to produce therapies? So what we're talking about is identifying genes that somehow have something to do with disease. But when whether you can then develop a gene therapy or a drug that mimics what the CRISPR intervention did, that is where all bets are off. Um, because we've just seen time and again that the time between discovery of a gene again, which is what CRISPR does, and a therapy based on that discovery is often measured in decades. Having something that you're finding out what the cause of a gene, but then having a drug hit the market years and years, pharmaceuticals exactly. so long. And I would 
insert only a single exception, um, which is one I spoke about tonight, and that's sickle cell disease. The reason that stands out to me as an exception is, as I said tonight, geneticists like to use the sort of phrase, it's easier to break something than to fix something. With sickle cell, if you can break a particular genetic switch using CRISPR, then you might be able to have patients continue to manufacture in their bodies a healthy form of hemoglobin, and they would never develop the actual sickle cell disease, even though they carry two genes for it. Um, that is very close to entering human studies, clinical trials. A number of biotech companies are interested, and whenever you have, you know, dare we say, commercial interest behind something, it's more likely to get pushed. And there are 100,000 patients in the United States with this awful, awful disease. So that just feels like one that might come sooner than the others. And it's interesting you said it's easier to break something than to fix it, because if you if we think about sickle cell, it's just one base that's messed up out of the 30 yes. or 3.2 billion base pairs. So it's interesting that actually breaking another part of the um, hemoglobin uh, system, system yeah. is what actually is going to fix it. Do you think that a lot of these single gene disorders, we may not actually be focusing on those mutations and more looking at those cycles and using CRISPR to focus on other areas in the cycle? It's possible. And the reason I'm not more you know, wildly enthusiastic and optimistic is that it has been so many years um, between when a gene has been identified as contributing to a disease. And remember, most diseases aren't single gene diseases. And the single gene diseases that do exist tend to, thank goodness, affect very, very few people, like the, many of them are orphan diseases. Um, it just feels like it's going to be more complicated than the rosiest-eyed optimists think. I mean, even with the sickle cell example, in all honesty, if the gene switch that people hope to knock out in order to enable patients to keep making healthy hemoglobin, if that genetic switch affects genes other than the hemoglobin one, then who knows what kind of adverse events and side effects you might be initiating. So that's, of course, why you do human trials. Um, you know, these amazingly brave and selfless people volunteer to be tested. It's an experimental therapy. You don't know if it's safe, let alone effective, but that's what it's going to take to show whether this is both safe and effective. And that's where we can start seeing, as you said, those off-target effects. And there's been th things in history, in scientific history, where those off-target effects have really affected people and causes death. Absolutely. Um, either, what's the phrase, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. So the known unknowns are, yes, we think that this other part of the genome might be affected by the CRISPR molecule that we thought and hoped was going to target only what we want it to affect. But in fact, these other things are affected as well. But what about the unknown unknowns, whether it's other parts of the genome or something non-genetic? Could there be an inflammatory reaction, an inflammatory response when you're introducing these nucleic acids and enzymes into people? That's been seen before. So again, I mean, that's why you do experiments. Definitely. And we're going to keep track of CRISPR and just see how many things it's going to impact and change. Do you see any other genetic editing technologies that are competing with CRISPR? Um, we've seen that zinc fingers and talons has not done as well as CRISPR, but do you see anything else popping up? Never say never, um, but really zinc fingers and talons just, you know, got bad branding. I mean, they are really going strong. Um, there's an important HIV clinical trial that uses zinc fingers to change human immune system cells, the T cells that HIV infects. Um, and what the zinc fingers do is change a molecule on the surface of the cell, a receptor, that the HIV virus uses to get in. If the receptor is changed, the virus can't get in, you're not infected with HIV, you don't develop AIDS. That's being done with zinc fingers by a biotech company, and it was launched way before CRISPR came on the landscape. So just because CRISPR is the one technology that's sucking all the air out of the room and getting turned into, you know, Jennifer Lopez TV shows does not mean that those earlier generations of genome editing tools are passe. They're harder to use. But harder to use matters mostly in an academic lab where it might be the professor, a postdoc, and two grad students. If you are a biotech company and you can throw industrial strength numbers of people at something, 
That's why Sangamo Biosciences is still using zinc fingers. That's why Selectus, which is a company in France, is using talons for some of its cancer therapies. They have not infinite resources, but certainly more resources and bodies than you know just a, a genetics lab at a university. So they still believe in these earlier generations of genome editing tools. And CRISPR is making things more universal, but it's not necessarily better, you're saying? The myth has grown up that it's better, that it's amazing, that it's whatever. It's easier to use. Um, you literally can stand at your keyboard in your lab and type in the nucleic acid sequence that you want your RNA to be, and that will, is what will be your guide RNA in your CRISPR um, assembly. You can't do that with zinc fingers and talons. Those are protein-based rather than nucleic acids. Um, so yeah, it's just harder to work with proteins. Proteins are huge molecules. Um, nucleic acids are nothing. Um, so those two will remain viable. Um, you know, there's huge, they're patented, they're licensed, there's a lot of money riding on them. So companies are not going to abandon them. CRISPR has democratized genome editing because it's so easy to use, because it's so cheap. Literally, you can get a CRISPR cassette for $65 from a nonprofit called AdGene. Um, and AdGene is a company we've had on the show before. Oh, cool. Yes. Um, so, you know, you just give them your PayPal account or whatever, and you too can be CRISPRing um, in a week or something. Um, so that democratization is really what CRISPR has going for it. Whether it will be more effective um, and transformative, uh, yeah, that remains to be seen. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today and sharing with UConn students tonight. Thank you. Great to talk to you. That wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. Check out the website, dnapodcast.com. Brand new. You can also follow on Twitter at DNA Podcast. And any questions you have about today's episode, the show in general, info at dnapodcast.com. Thanks for listening and join me next week to learn discover new advances in the world of genetics.